Well, welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Olivier Krischer. I am a city-based uh, historian curator and curator of a bridge, which is currently on a WMA space in Hong Kong. Um, and the bridge, of course, is an exhibition by Wang Tae, who joins us in conversation today with Michelle Wong. Um, I am going to just run through a few things about the format of the conversation, um, why we're here, and then some introductions as well. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge, of course, that I'm speaking from Sydney, which is unceded Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, um, land never ceded. Um, Today, we're gonna to have a conversation, which is one of um, a few that we've organized in parallel to the exhibition project, both when it was held originally in Sydney and now in its iteration at WMA in Hong Kong. And these conversations have really been conceived together with Wei Ling um, as a way of unpacking, opening some uh, other sorts of threads or ideas that come um, from the project that are also in her current practice. So previous conversations have included um, uh, conversations with artists, curators uh, who have um, similar or complementary concerns around history, memory, for example, um, also photographic practice. Um, and today um, we're delighted, of course, that Michelle's joining us in uh, a conversation which Originally, when we were talking about it, was very much thinking about uh, collaboration. So thinking about the fact that Michelle and Welling um, know each other's practices very well, know each other very well, and have uh, also collaborated in the past. Um, and also thinking about uh, image making and making sense, as the title of today's talk suggests, making sense, making images, um, how we make visual sense through image making um, and in uh, our preparation for today's conversation, uh, Michelle and Wayling also kind of pinpointed one particular collaboration, which is the project Sightlines, which we'll talk about um, at the beginning of this conversation, and they'll be presenting a little bit about that together. So I will um, just uh, sort of say a little bit about both Michelle and Wayling. I'm sure many of you are already familiar uh, with both of them, but uh, Michelle is of course a Hong Kong-based researcher and currently a PhD student in art history at the University of Hong Kong. From 2012 to 2020, she was a researcher at Asia Art Archive uh, with a focus on Hong Kong art history and histories of exchange and circulation through exhibitions and periodicals. And many uh, will be familiar, of course, with the work that she did on Habik Chun Archive uh, a little bit of which we may get a, an opportunity to talk about today um, and its relationship in particular to thinking about Ha's photographic practice or photos in the, in the Ha archive. She is um, known for that work, but in addition, her art writing and curatorial work is also quite prolific. Most recently, she's curated Portal Stories and Other Journeys, um, co-organized by Ezra Archive and Taipun Contemporary uh, this year. Uh, Wei Ling is uh, a cross-disciplinary artist based in Singapore who works closely with photography, video, and audio, interrogating the ways that we see and present the world we live in through the practice of image making. She was, of course, based in Hong Kong um, between 1999 and 2015. Um, her work has often been inspired by personal um, family histories or the history or family histories of others. Um, often acquaintances that whom, with whom she forms a relationship through field work and interviews. She works with archival materials, social environments, um, and her work's also informed by her photojournalistic background. She sees this as a way to, as allowing her to contextualize um, the issues that she's dealing with um, and its complex emotions and memories to establish a distinctive visual language that encapsulates such multiplicity. Uh, some of that, of course, is on exhibition in the Abridge project uh, currently at WMA. Welling has an MFA from Bard College, and she's collected by many major institutions in Asia, Australia, and the US, and has been the recipient of significant grants from the National Arts Council Singapore and Yale School of Art, um, amongst other places. So just a, a word about 
sort of housekeeping, I guess. Um, I'll remind people that we are recording this conversation. Uh, so it will be edited and later shared online. Um, so we assume that um, your questions and so on, um, the way that we'll, that, uh, we'll deal with questions is we welcome you to put them in the Q&A, which is uh, the question and answer window is at the bottom right of your screen. Um, or you can also write your questions in the chat function if that works better for you. I'll read them out. Um, other than that, uh, I'll get things underway. We do have some slides as well. Um, and so I'll invite, first of all, um, Wailing and Michelle to talk us through their previous collaboration sight lines. And the reason that we're thinking about this is because of some of the um, in a formal sense, some of the complementary issues that that project already started to unpack, which I think has a certain resonance with a bridge and certainly at many of the conversations that Wehling and I have had in developing um, the exhibition, uh, but also for the, the fact of working together and what collaboration means, how it can work um, and how it's been a part of um, the, the sort of relationship, the working relationship between Michelle and Wailing in the past. So we'll talk a little bit about sightlines to, to get the conversation started. Michelle, do you want to bring up your yeah. slide? Great. Thank you. Let me just bring up the slides. Yeah. So I mean, sightlines is a in collaborative or collective project, however you want to call it, that um, Wiling and I worked together on with a few other practitioners in Hong Kong um, from 2017, I believe, up till 2016. Yes. Oh, 2016 up till 2019. Um, and sort of in, in the sort of next, I think 40, 45 minutes or so, or a little less than that will walk you through how we've come about with that, um, some of the things that we made together or made with one another. And the exhibition then, or the project eventually then had two iterations of exhibitions. One actually, the first one outside of Hong Kong and the second one back in Hong Kong. And we'll also talk through sort of how we've worked through those um, different iterations. Yeah. Um, you wanna start, Wei Ling? Um, I guess if you can, yeah, I think maybe Michelle can also talk about this because we, we, when we first, we first started the project, uh, because of a prompt actually from Abby, right? Yeah. Abby Chan, who, um, used to work at the Chinese culture center in San Francisco and is now at the Asian art museum in San Francisco. And, um, Abby called me uh, one day when I was actually in Guangzhou at the time. It was the, during the time of the Guangzhou Biennial. And she sort of came up with this invitation with her um, colleague at the time, Duan Ziying, saying that, oh, we're trying to do this public art documentation project that we will give you a 360 camera. So a camera that has like a fish eye, I guess, that will let you document 360. Um, you know, like we want to do this in multiple sites and we thought about you in Hong Kong, would you be interested in doing that? Um, and we're like, sure, we can work with this um, camera. But the thing is, you know, in Hong Kong, your sight lines are constantly being cut by different planes of um, construction and building. So it's actually not really possible to document things in 360. But we can turn the 360 camera into a tool with which we have a conversation about image making and about seeing the city, which you know was also sort of reeling from, from the effects of whatever happened in 2014 at the time. Yeah, I think at that time we were we were talking and then it became it felt like a good idea, you know, in terms of, you know, how do you see the city, but then also then how can you see each other and how can you work with one another? Um, in the city then, um, I think we were not sure. I think one of the things that we were thinking about was also, you know, when things had changed at that point, uh, you know, 2016, uh, how, how can you work together? I think that there was, there was, there was a, I guess there was an erosion, slow erosion 
of you know I, I guess the fabric at that point already. So then it was just you know how how can uh, I guess as in the arts how can we be together or work together or inspire each other in an environment like that. And so uh, uh, we we brought together or rather Michelle brought together I think uh, subs six of us right yeah. Um, I think, you know, like some of the questions that we were thinking, I was thinking at that time was, you know, what does it mean to be seeing in 360 degrees? It's physically impossible, right, for the human eye to do that. And what does that mean when, when, when us as human beings get an extension technologically by something that at that time was very new, but quickly went outdated? Um, how would that sort of change the way that we see or think about how we see and as practitioners, well, I don't make images, but my friends do. You know, I'm just so curious about what my friends would do with this thing. And so, um, you know, with that, then how do you see a city in sort of a, a moment after sort of, you know, huge destruction of, um, of protest and of sort of demonstration? How do you come back to what seems to be normal, but is no longer? Um, and I'm talking about the umbrella movement at the time. And also, you know, how do you see each other? Um, in this sort of huge political rupture and also sort of economic social rupture. And yeah. as practitioners, how do you see each other's practices, right? Yeah, so then at that point, so there were six of us. So then it was uh, Lam Weisi, uh, uh, Kin Choi Lam, mm. uh, TNG, which were uh, Gakam and Clara and Sao Tho. Yeah. And then Michelle and myself. Yeah. And it, it was quite interesting because um, I think we were all brought together by this tool that I think most of us didn't know how to use. So mm. it's quite, <laughs> it's, it's a, a quite um, ironic because quite a few of us, you know, uh, in the group actually work specifically with, let's say, photography or video or image making in that sense. But then this was a, it's a consumer tool really. Um, but then, um, and it's something where you know, you're creating VR, you're creating this thing where people want want to see in that way, so to speak. But then um, people in the group were not sure how to use it. So um, that was actually quite a good beginning, I think. And then, and uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask how you, um, I guess, decided how to use it. Like, what was the, what was the conversation like? Because uh -huh. you've already you've already seemed to put your finger on vision itself as a kind of contended space or sort of coming to terms with mm. something again. And it is an unfamiliar tool. Um, what was the conversation like in terms of deciding how you would work with it in a way that would be um, functional perhaps for each of your respective sort of practices? Right. Or... I think uh, also to uh, uh, see very quickly that I guess all six of us were, are from were from are from very different generations, um, and and um, so for example, you know, Asi was fresh out of school, right? So it's just the range where she's fresh out of school, where I guess CNG are much more um, have been in the scene for quite a while, but also where um, everybody has very different practices, where you know some might be more. Uh, inward looking in their practice, um, whereas then others might be more outward looking and having you know workshops and kind of more public events as part of their practice. So then it was also a kind of bringing together people who had very different ways of making and very different ways uh, of seeing. Of course, everybody has a different way of seeing, but then it was just it wasn't so streamlined, I think, so to speak. So then it was also quite interesting. You know, and then when you ask Olivier, how do you? Um, how do you decide? And I think that we also felt, and Michelle just pulled out, we also felt that we needed some parameters for ourselves. Lots of parameters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how can we make this work? And how can, um, yeah, how can we make this yeah. work? I mean, everyone approached the tool very differently, right? And I think one of the things that interested us a lot was also, you know, if you put two people or two groups of people who would definitely treat that tool very differently and make them talk about how they've worked with it then you know what would happen um so we came up with this sort of schedule where the camera is being handed from one person to another and as they meet you know they they, they have a conversation 
about how they've worked with it. And you know, if they so choose to, they can respond to the previous person's whatever images with their own image. I think that actually resulted in something that's very interesting where the conversation is not only just in person, but it's also through image making. Um, and in some cases, sort of even transforming it even further, like Kim Choi will look at it later on that, you know, transform some of the images that he made into illustrations. Um, there's also this sort of obsession with trying to flatten the goldfish eye into a flat image, where then curved lines become straight lines, straight lines become curved, you know, what is right, what is wrong. Um, that all of that comes into play, which again was very poignant and prevalent in the way that we were trying to deal with, you know, how we how we were being in Hong Kong at that time. It's interesting that the fisheye, um, you know, it's just another kind of lens, but of course, because of its extreme sort of perspective, it shows how the act of seeing is also a manipulative kind of process, right? Like yeah. it, it makes uh, it makes things you know it distorts things, um, but it's actually just an extreme version of the lenses that we usually use, which mm. we believe don't distort things. Anyway, and of course we lost the camera afterwards. Like in yeah. no time, not only has it become obsolete, we've lost it. We cannot locate it. Perfectly. <laughs> So this is um, Clara and Gum with Kin Troy in, in um, CNG's um, apartment. Um, and this is, I think, South and a C meeting at APO in um, Oil Street. And this is also when we began playing with the, with the camera. Um, sorry. And then this is Wailing Zoom. Skyping into um, a meeting that we were having in uh, Clara and Gum's place. And this is also a really sort of interesting moment. I think this was Kin Choi Studio in Food Hub Building, where mm. we actually got together and looked at some of the videos and images that people were making after a jota, after a morning tea breakfast. Yeah, so in, in a way, like earlier just now, uh, Michelle showed that, that kind of schedule that we had for each other where we would be, uh, where the camera would be passed because there's only one camera, but also then we were trying to make a point. At that point, I was already living in Singapore, but then we were trying to make a point to be able to meet and to be able to do things together, um, I guess, as much as possible, you know, within for everybody's schedules. And so then it was, and also then when we came together, what could we do? How could we help each other? Um, what could we talk about? Um, in terms of, I guess, building the project. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. And then, so it's like through these conversations and processes that, you know, works or images that eventually became sort of more finalized works for some, some, some yeah. of us sort of came out. And this is Kin Choi's um, work in 2017 from December to April. Um, which is sort of, it also plays, plays with the form of the film strip. Like when you sort of cut open that um, fish yeah. eye, it becomes like a square. But um, I guess, you know, there are, because it's a, I guess because it's round, it also then doesn't add up in some ways and it can be edited in such a way that a loop then becomes a film strip almost. And Kin Choi then uses this to move back and forth, right? Yeah, it was really nice actually that that on one hand, uh, you know, it's it's it was very much about the conversation, but then because um, because you know, many of us had been you know working with the camera, or working with this kind of image making for quite a while, then the kind of referencing that started happening also uh, with the works um, to you know the you know different types of the medium were actually really really nice to see, and so for example this this was when he was taking the tram between Admiralty and, and Causeway Bay. So he was taking it back and forth. And, um, and then a kind of flattening the video out to kind of show that passage between the two sites um, in, in the video, but then at the same time showing the medium, which I thought was a, was a really nice work because then it becomes, it's, it's quite subtle and you're just sitting in the tram looking, but then sometimes you see some of those some of these buildings that go by 
and you kind of know where you are. Very important landmarks. Yeah. Mm. Do, um, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit more um, about that sense of rediscovery? I mean, it seems like the, the camera in this case becomes um, a means to form a, a rediscovery or a kind of reunion in some ways with this tea. Well, I think for me, when I look at this work, um, I can't speak for him, but then it felt, for me, it felt like a reliving almost mm. of um, what happened and also then traversing between um, those two places, Admiralty and Causeway Bay. Um, oh. It was quite interesting also because uh, I remember Kim Choi, um, after the work was made, he had a hard time, or not a hard time, it took him a while to think of what the title should be. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, so then I guess it's from December to April 2007. Yeah. I think the reliving, you know, that's the exact, the first word that came to my mind also. The reliving is, you know, the geographical sort of pacing of back and forth, but it also is that temporal pacing of back and mm. forth, of reliving a certain moment where your city was different and there was mm. the possibility of difference as well. Mm. How was this presented? Oh, we'll get to it. Yes, we'll be quicker. <laughs> okay, okay. So then, because um, <laughs> we can keep talking. Yeah. So this is a C uh, sticking the camera into a, a cone, like a caution, like wet floor cone. It's just to yeah, see, you know, what you capture. Oh. And then. Yeah, I think it's just in terms of uh, experimenting with, you know, just over the next few. Uh, slides because you're asking how because because it's a tool that was new to everybody you know how do you use this how can I use this and for her she started putting it into different holes and she was trying to see what it was but then also one of the things which was quite interesting for me um, to watch was because she was thinking about this thing where we were thinking about conversation and so then she mm. tried to force herself to have meals with people, you know, where you can tap toy and share the table with somebody mm -hmm. else. And stick a camera in the middle the and make the person ask you like, what the hell is this? Yeah, so she, mm -hmm. and I think she's perhaps not so used to me. It was, it was actually quite interesting watching her try to uh, make herself do something that she was not so used to doing. <laughs> yeah. And then from there you have, this is actually a, a, a participation of the 360 camera in a conversation of the talk over handover group who were at the mm -hmm. time, you know, organizing an exhibition for 2017, right? The 20th anniversary of the handover. And this is then, you know, them sticking the, it must be Clara and Gum sticking the, the camera into this sort of group conversation. Oh, and then it was the Lazy Susan, right? Yes. <laughs> so... And then that, you know, this became the, the sticking in hole thing that Kim Choi picked that up and stick it in a hole in a drain in a park, then ended up actually capturing tiny, tiny ants and moving around, mm. uh, which then he transformed into an illustration. So there are also these sort of transformation and experimentation with medium. They're very specific to the artists themselves. Kim Choi now works mostly with drawing and illustrating children's book. Mm. And then this is South Ho, um, where, you know, like they're, they're hiking with friends um, and sort of in, I think this is Daingo and Yingo at the time, which, you know, again, there were sort of land redevelopment disputes. And so they went and hiked and look at the sites. And what South then sort of realized, and he has this really interesting way of saying of, oh, um, whatever is curved becomes straight and whatever is straight becomes curved in a 360 um, camera lens, yeah. right? And in Cantonese, you know, like sometimes what is straight is what is right what is curved is what is wrong. So here you actually yeah. then, the camera captures a very meta situation where you don't know what is right or wrong or they become interchangeable, which again, you know, are almost sort of prophetic sort of readings or experiences that, you know, we, we sort of get to experience. Um, yeah. He then, so, cause also um, Sal's work, you know, also combines drawing with photography. 
And so this is what he then went to photograph this um, site of redevelopment in Samsoibo Panzai, which was formerly a fabric trading center, uh, which has since been demolished. And what he had done is sort of photograph the, the people who, who were at the time there and flattening it and then turning the skies um, sort of straight with these um, color pencil lines. And the work that he eventually did has sort of four sets of um, these inkjet prints with um, color pencils on it. And, and he put this photo back into a virtual reality tour. So turning that into, again, an image that is sort of friendly to the 360 lens, and that mm. becomes a virtual tour. So again, you know, whatever was curved now becomes straight again. Yeah, but he was using that on a tablet as opposed to one of those goggles, right? So then it was, a, again, a, a very different way of looking. No, it was a tablet where you then... Yeah, it was the he wasn't using the goggle, it was the tablet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Then uh, we have CNG Art Prime. And do you want to speak about this? You can you can talk about it and I'll just um, jump yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. So what you see Clara and Gum here, they're drawing on a piece of paper that's installed around the blind line of the 360 camera. So it then actually becomes a whole sort of area that you cannot see. And what they are drawing are their interpretations of uh, a story told by their friend who has had uh, unusual ghostly encounters uh, with uh, supernatural beings in museums. And he's a security guard. Oh. Uh, and so, and in Cantonese, you know, the word ghost also means people who you cannot trust or people who might betray you. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're then illustrating these um, stories, but, you know, as viewers, you cannot see what they're drawing. And um, so the way that CNG display this work is there is the drawing that they made, and then there is a VR that you look at, which then you see them drawing, but you cannot see what they actually drew. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it's an extremely interesting thing where Clara and Gum, who in some ways are are the people who work less with image making actually really leaned into sort of playing with that VR form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and using that blind spot. Yeah. Yeah. And then we eventually made a zine um, that sort of documented, but also sort of, I guess, articulate some of the thoughts that we were thinking through. Because when we were meeting uh, with one another, we also had conversations uh, with each other and recorded some parts of it. And then we worked with um, Currency, which is this sort of design studio in um, Singapore in sort of messing up all of these narratives, as well as the process work, sort of making them formally as well as in terms of content and linearity work with and against one another. So just to create a different kind of experience um, about with sidelines. And that became a form that we continue to work with. Yeah, the, the interview form, yeah. anyone also you mean the discussion between the group and kind of recording that and bringing it back into the process? Yeah, yeah. So then it was all. It was. Um, I guess often it was the two of us with um, with one of the artists. So in in this project, I I was more. I wasn't making art, work, so to speak. So then I was. I guess my my role was more curatorial. Um, but so then, then it was then these conversations that we're having with people and just thinking about the, 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 I guess the inclinations or their concerns as they were working through and then I guess seeing then the correspondences or adjacencies that they had with each other and how they form each other, you know, one after the other. Yeah, I'm curious because I know that um, in the background to uh, I see a lot of like the process in this project. Uh, I'm, I'm curious at how, how it sort of develops for you personally into some of the current work that you're doing. And I know that you've had um, uh, you know, questions for your process uh, and that in some ways the, 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 the um, sea prints that developed in a bridge came from a kind of um, a need to rethink or a wish to rethink your your relationship with photography. Uh, I'm wondering is, is the curatorial role that you can you, you took in this project, was that a conscious kind of 
refusal to make images? Like, what, how did you come to that point? Were you sort of distancing yourself from that, that part of your process a little bit? Oh, no. But I don't remember actually why. But I was very keen on the, the interview aspect. So uh, one, I guess, one key aspect of my practice has been the interview, right? And, and right. For, for many of my uh, projects over the many years, I have, um, it, it was always about conversation. And it was always often maybe you could call them topical or they, you know in terms of when we're thinking about how how do i talk so then there was that process of how do you talk how do you negotiate but always with perhaps someone who could you can construe it as we construe it as a subject or uh, talk about a subject matter whereas then when you bring that kind of interview process i think into uh, uh working with art, art peer, uh, artist peers or colleagues in the arts, how then do you uh, use or work with that interview process to bring out other aspects of, of, of a collaboration or a collective project, let's say. Mm. I think that for me, the, that was quite a challenging, or quite, is quite a challenging thing because, you know, I think that Michelle and I have had conversations about this where, you know, when, when, you know, when you come together to, to make something together so how how do you how how do you think about that labor how do you think about conversation is there a hierarchy in the conversations you know of course obviously with this when we first started the project because um as michelle likes to call me a control freak there we like, there were these kind of frameworks that, that we were kind of making um which that seemed like you know is that a way to make help this make it easier streamline or are you imposing too much, you know, how do people push back, how do people respond to this? So all of those things that come in, um, I think were, uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, were quite new to me, I think, in this process. Mm. But, but at the same time, I think very important in engaging, I think, with um, peers and also then helping myself think about, okay, what is this process that I had been doing uh, that, that, I, that I'm doing now? And, and how does this, I guess, affect everybody involved? And I, I think that it, it actually was uh, one of the things for me where, let's say for a bridge, where, you know, like where I did start the project interviewing people, but then it's also um, thinking about the interviews in a more structural manner, you know, what is actually being said? How is it being said? Why is it being said? So, so then it, 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 I think we kind of inform each other mm. that way. And Michelle, if I take that question to you in terms of, I know that, from reading also some of the conversations that become part of the, um, the project and the documentation around the project, this collaboration meant different things and was approached in different ways by um, the different collaborators. Um, what did that look like from, or how did that feel from your perspective? Um, what did that collaboration, how did that change for you? Um. I think for me, it sightlines is uh, is about having a conversation, and you know the thing about having conversation is sometimes it has no it has no end, um, mm. and and uh, and we were actually just talking about this way before we sort of came onto the webinar, is the that you know these conversations you, you have them all the time, or you know you choose to have it with some people for a very long time but they're not always in forms and ways that are very visible. Um, mm. And I think, you know, Sightlines is, is one such opportunity where we try to make that conversation visible. And conscious. And, yeah, and very conscious and also, you know, in, you can almost call it sort of performative, but the people that have come together don't perform in certain ways. So the, the, when, when we are being pushed to do certain things, then I think very interesting turns happen. And uh, for example, you know, like I remember very distinct, distinctly that a number of people were at the same time trying to make the camera do flat things. And Kin tried literally tried to push it into a corner. And this is when, you know, the, the technology and our sort of physical world and our physical limitations have sort of really sort of rub against one another. And it's in these sort of things that 
you really think about how you want to live in this world and how do you want your practice to be in conversation mm. with one another and also you know with south ho you know we ended up we remember, remember that day when we were in um Fuda Lao, right? we ended up talking about abstraction mm. and these yeah. are things that you know unless you almost sort of engineer a certain situation where you have to do that it's not necessarily something that you would just like bring up um, Can, do you remember the contours of that conversation because abstraction is something that's come up of course in you know our discussion around the bridge and the sort of abstraction of the image and the sort of layering and, and in some ways the mining of the, the image mm. um it, what, what what was the abstraction within sightlines well, for that, what particularly we were actually talking about those images that you just saw, uh, where the, on the hiking trail, I think, for, mm -hmm. um, a little bit with in terms of those the lines. So we were we were um, just talking about the different photos that he had made with the camera, and and I guess uh, discussing how he was doing it and why he was doing it. I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, so these lines in the background are they part of the a, a sort of camera effect or is this an introduced element? these are the the sort of the curved lines are kind of um the i guess experimentation that he was playing with because of these lines mm. um and i think that level of abstraction was also very much about dealing with truth you know, dealing with experience and mm. the mediation of media or, you know, disagreements that you have people, that you have with people, which I think a lot of people had, had difficulty dealing with at that time, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah, that, it's making me think about something in a different direction, which we've talked a bit about the production, the kind of um, thinking through the, the medium and, and the way that there's a kind of conscious relationship to the camera here that facilitates the collaboration. But I'm wondering also how these works are seen um, and aware that originally this was for an exhibition in San Francisco. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like, um, both in terms of making something, knowing that it's gonna be seen somewhere else outside of the context and, mm. and eventually how it is seen or discussed? Yeah, so I'm just running through some photos, but I think maybe this is a sort of good place to start. Um, I mean, to address Olivier's question. Yeah, so Sightlines eventually, you know, when it first sort of met as exhibition viewing public, it was actually not in Hong Kong. Um, we all managed to, uh, with the general support of the Hong Kong Arts Development Council, managed to all go to San Francisco together. Um, and then found ourselves, you know, found our project sort of being surrounded by also other practices um, mm -hmm. that are dealing with, you know, urbanization, change, in some cases also sort of much more activistic uh, approaches towards, um, towards art. Yeah. Um, but the sort of the, in, and this is in 41 Ross, which is this sort of shop space in San Francisco Chinatown. Uh, mm. And it's not the main space of Chinese Cultural Center. Their main space is actually downtown in a hotel. So this is sort of their community art space, mm -hmm. uh, which is in, in Chinatown. And Chinatown in San Francisco, of course, you know, is a, is a site full of um, history of activism, of sort of racial equality, justice struggle, all of that. So to find ourselves sort of being nested in that and being in conversation with um, SF base artists and also um, a group from Progrifa Delta and also Michael Long from Hong Kong. That, you know, that was sort of also a little sort of sent a little nice. shock in the system. <laughs> it was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> because we're not, we, we don't talk about the work this way. Mm. It's almost like, it's a very interiorized, it's a very internal, we, like we just want to talk about art and image making, but then, realizing that the images that we see and of course are ways of dealing with you know political changes around us but also then now being in a situation where you have to speak about it that way because your viewers are coming with certain assumptions and I think that was also quite interesting a challenge. I think that it was also uh, really nice to uh, see the works I think um, side by side with works that were perhaps a lot more overt 
in in how they were being political. Um, where let's say for uh, someone like uh, Kim Choi, or actually everybody's work was was it was actually through the form, which for me was really nice. That where they were trying to be uh, perhaps think about what had happened or push back against what had happened or what was going to happen you know, in some places. So so then it it wasn't an oh there there was no there were no slogans there were no or there were in some of the pictures maybe in the in the fabric place but then there were no overt slogans or a kind of agenda agendas in that way. Um, so then it was actually really interesting to have them sit alongside um, those types of works uh, because we were actually asked uh, in the exhibition, right, um, when we were there, um, well, how we saw the works, I think. Mm. Mm. Could you maybe talk a little bit to that with, um, perhaps I can recognize um, some of the work that's presented, but not all. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about some of the, the work that came up. You mean the work in San Francisco or the conversation? That the, we the work that we see here in the slides. Uh, so this is, you know, at the at the right side, that's South Hole's um, sort of four inkjet prints with um, color pencil and drawing and then sort of being put back into the virtual tour. So that's right, sort of next to a lot of the sort of slogans that the Pearl River Delta Group and Manu's um, collaborators sort of collected. Mm. Um, and then... Also just now we saw Kim Choi's work next to the... Next to Michael uh, Lang. Yeah. Um, sorry. And oh, sorry, I was trying to look for Weston. And this West is Weston Turia, who is a San Francisco-based um, artist. You want to speak about his work there too? Well, he had the, a performance where he had made these paper buildings and he, it was this performance that he, he did in front of the I Hotel, right? Um, which was a hotel where a lot of the immigrants um, were living before they were evicted. Mm. And so he had, they, they actually, it was really nice. They had this older TV that they had put on the floor right near the entrance. And in the TV was his performance where he has these paper buildings that he's made, he's sweeping the pavement um, at these dragging it and dragging them slowly kind of falls apart and and uh, across you know and these different sites that were quite important and so then it was it was really nice actually to have him as part of the exhibition and, and talk to him uh, again that, then again a different type of practice where you are thinking about um, you know what's happening in society mm. in and it's a, it's a very direct engagement in that case with this, the city, with urban form and that sort of intervention. Yeah, and also through performance. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were also sort of in conversation with um, people from Stanford University where they had um, sort of urban studies and you know, finding then ourselves having to to answer to question is like, why why are your why is your why is your work so abstract? And we're like, mm. I think you know, like, or why is the politics so abstract? Or mm. um, and did did that change how the project was then brought to um, to Hong Kong? I mean, what happened as a result or with 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 the benefit, I guess, of these conversations and this exhibition experience in San Francisco? Was the project developed in a different way? Did it, mm. what happened I, next? I think after that, we, we felt that we really wanted to bring it back to Hong Kong. Mm. And, um, and, and so we did, um, we, she sent a proposal to Jing, who's at the Hong Kong, who was at the Hong Kong Art Center. Uh, back then, and uh, we were able to actually have uh, an exhibition at the Hong Kong Art Center during um, Art Basel, I guess it opened, um, I guess. During we, Art Week, yeah, right before uh, that. Right? Yeah. And, uh, we, we thought it was, it's it's like, you know, sometimes you, you make these things and it's just like, why, when you show it, you really want to also bring it back to show it to an audience who has also experienced what you are trying to make works about, right? So then that was something that was, I think, really important for 
um, everybody. But also at the same time, uh, when the, the project was coming back, it was also then, what else can we do? Because you know the, that exhibition was in 2019, which was two years, a year and a half or so, but it was quite a while after the exhibition in San Francisco. So then you know, everybody's life has changed. So for example, yeah. at that point, uh, Kim Choi was uh, living in the UK, right? Um, and so then people, so there were different things going on in people's lives. So then it was just like, so you can't actually do, you, do you show the same old work again? So how do you, or, or if you show that work, how do you? How do you transform it, right? Or how do you make it relevant to your now, to your present? And I yes. think that's also the, the, that's the sort of collective agreement that, you know, as much as we would love to share the work that we've done and shown in San Francisco, it is also important to then further that thinking and conversation of, you know, further digest what had happened and what it means to people's practices. Mm. Um, and so then, you know, and the experimental gallery is this weird little space like behind the theater um, which, you know, is also, it's like a boomerang with this sort of hexagonal space in the middle, which, you know, was also challenging and, and interesting. But what we ended up being able to do is um, we did this projection, which is um, actually a C's 2017 work uh, when she was working with the 360 camera. And she ended up going recording water cycles or she became sort of fascinated by this sort of idea of cyclical time or like things mm. that go in cycle. And one of the cycles that surround us all the time living in cities is the water cycle. And so she ended up like recording water faucets and then turning it round with whatever video um, editing that she was doing, um, photographing rain, and uh, these different water cycles or different sort of passages of water then got edited into sort of little planets. They almost looked mm. like um, the cosmos. And this one that you're seeing here is the, is the sunset. Mm. Here you then see, you know, someone who works primarily with uh, a flat image then sort of becoming really fascinated with the round and then sort of manipulating it, sort of reversing that limitation of the image but then pointing towards something in some ways is much more, much bigger than oneself. Mm. And yeah, so, I, yeah. I found that always quite poetic to actually have that sort of anchor in the middle in that very dead space that actually became a gathering point for people. Yeah, it was actually really nice because the work originally was shown on a wall where then now you are changing a perspective where you then look down onto this horizontal surface. So then what was what for, um, I guess, all the artists in the, who were in the project, then we showed two works, right? We showed the work that was uh, uh, originally made with San Francisco, but then also we had lost the camera after San Francisco, so then there was no longer a, a 360 camera. So then, so then it was also then thinking about you know, how do you uh, think back to what your work was before and mm. what it would be, but then also what Hong Kong was to you now in that sense. So then there was that kind of conversation, internal and that kind of external conversation that was going on also then with the works that were being made. Mm. Mm. There's quite, I mean, for me, there seems to be quite a resonance um, with some of the development of the current project at the bridge um, in that respect, like trying to come to terms with these shifts in time and also your distance to the site. Um, I don't know, is that something that you've thought about, Wayne? I think it's always, you know, like as, uh, as a person or as an artist or whatever, you know, you change or grow, right? So then sometimes you don't really, um, you see something that you made a few years ago, you're like, oh, maybe I did that. It's like, so can, maybe not anymore. And you kind of move on or you want to change it, you know, that for me at least. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it, it's, it's actually really nice to, as, you know, in this, we'll show some examples where then, let's say for Kim Choi, that it, it feels like it's very similar what he made, but it's totally different. Uh, we'll show the work again, but this was then similarly for myself in terms of a bridge, you know, where it's taking the same material, so to speak, or the same, uh, the, the same photos that were made, 
many years ago and then kind of remaking them where uh, technically it's the same it's the same thing right because it's the same slide it's the same picture then but then you don't actually see any of that where then it becomes a totally different uh, work entirely and but then also where the, the kind of formal qualities for me at least um, become a lot more important in in the work simply because I think for myself more and more um, the informational aspect of you know the, the image let's say or the interview I keep asking myself how do I what do I do with this how can I depict this through a formal gesture let's say mm. so then that becomes something that is quite important for me and so then in terms of this project uh, with with sidelines with some of our peers in the group it was then it was really interesting to see how they would also then take a similar idea let's say and then change it um not not, okay, not that they were changing it, they were just making a different work right but you can see the 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 trajectory and you can see mm. the, the thread that runs through it you know? mm. yeah. yeah before we came on to the webinar michelle you were kind of talking about this idea of the formal gesture or sort yeah. of doing formally. Do you want to kind of ask that question if you can <laughs> sure. really formulate it? Um, yeah, I mean, Winnie and I, you know, have, have been companions of one another's practices for a number of years. Um, and I mean, what, what has always sort of struck me and I and, and enjoy it immensely is how the you know, you've called, Olivia, you called it the material turn, you know, um, of, you know, wearing, returning to, to material of not just photography, but even objects or sort of rephotographing objects. And I, it, for me, it is also this sort of journeying into a world that is so much more interior and so much more personal for wailing and that, you know, with that material turn, the, the works that comes out of this investigation has also become more formal. And, you know, and, you know, maybe Wayling can talk a little more about how that might be related or, you know, how has the formal gesture or the move towards this formalism has been a solution for you in terms of looking at different, very different topics that you were saying earlier. I think that it hasn't, been a solution but it, it's been something that I felt that is important because it is making visual art right so it's, it's so you make something that that becomes very tan for me at least in that sense with the photo it's something that's to say something tangible with the form uh, is, is really difficult you know how do I uh, how do I um, visualize a type of memory how do i visualize a type of loss you know how do i visualize in in the photograph uh, without using representation I, I think that um that for me is actually really exciting and it is also i think in parallel to you know how more and more you know if you look around everything is photoshopped or everything people are so suspicious of the image right so then how can we also confront something that is that we see and use and live with on a day-to-day -day level and i think that that becomes really important the form becomes really important and so then it becomes for me really important to tackle it and not just you know mm -hmm. photograph people and represent like this is this person is so and so or this person said this this person had this experience this person passed through borders like that you know so because it's like you know uh, there's I think that at this point, it has to be a lot more than that because, you mm. know, we get those kinds of stories and narratives in so many different types of media. So how, you know, you get it on TV, you get it on radio, you get it on the arts, you get it everywhere. So, but then why show it in the gallery or why show it in any specific platform that you use? Uh, I think that is something that is quite key at this point. I think it's interesting that, um like there is this sort of blending and tension between form and content, which seems like such an old hat binary nowadays. Um, but certainly in your work, um, Wailing, and even in, in the Sightlines project, where the, the, because there's such an obvious presence of this camera in the, in the works process, 
um, it, it's problematized, you know, like it's kind mm. of opened up. Um, and that's something that I've noticed in, in Whaling's practice, um, which in, a, in an interesting way, it seems to have gone via um, the spatialization of your work in installation. Like there's a, you know, a number of projects that you've, you've had that introduced objects, you know, found objects and so on, and you've done projections onto material and so on. And in some ways, the, the, the bridge seems to be almost a return to, to mm. photogra photographic form um, on the surface because you're presenting prints and you're presenting you know, video. Um, and yet you've managed to kind of present these as image objects. I, I come back to this term because you know, the C print is reflective and it's, it has this particular presence in the space. So it's, I, I, I don't know if you're thinking about it in this way, but um, I, I find that the work at the moment is um, really trying to blur those boundaries between what we assume to be the form and what we assume to be the content. And there's something at that interplay. I think it's also then that the form itself or the medium of its previous form becomes the content also, right? So then uh, I think that uh, when you talked about the, the projections and when I was you know, projecting on different surfaces and things like that, like, like for example, the, the uh, series of uh, uh, works that I had made with the show at NUS Museum, where there was a kind of um, protraction and maybe expansion of the two-dimensional image into a projected form on uh. different surfaces. I think in more recent, in the last two years maybe, where then I'm trying to compress it all back again where, where then everything that had been opened up um, goes back into a two-dimensional flat photograph. But then within that photograph, you, I try to think about what had been taken apart and how that can be portrayed or you know, depicted also then within, within the frame of that piece of paper. I, I, uh, I wanted I want to sort of throw this to Michelle, you know, with your curatorial cap on as well. But um, because we've talked a little bit about how you're one of the few people in our conversations who've actually seen the work in the space, mm. so um, it's it's been an interesting process because in each case, you know, the work's been shown in Sydney, and Wellington couldn't come to Sydney, and mm. now it's in Hong Kong, and so there's in some ways there is a you know this distance has also been a part of the process, like thinking about a space that's at a distance. But for you listening to the way that Wayne's talking about the work, um, how does that translate in as a, as a viewer, I guess, um, in the, for the exhibition as it is in Hong Kong at the moment? Um, does that make visual sense? Do you see other things coming out from the relationship of the work in the space? Mm. Visual sense, yes, it does make visual sense. And I think, you know, like C prints are very shiny and you then, you know, are drawn to, to try to go, go look at it. Um, but then at the same time, you know, like, and the, this is a thing when, you know, when, when an exhibition, I mean, this is, at least I can, I know that Willing and Olivier were not here to install. Like mm. I go in and I'm like, oh, I know they, you know, it for, for me as an exhibition viewer, I think there's a certain tactility that actually comes with, you know, the makers being there and, you know, but, but this is what it is to, we, we have to deal with. And I think that's why for me, it's always interesting to hear the, that you guys talk about them being image objects, but also knowing that you guys may not have experienced them this time around as image objects. Uh, mm. And whether or not there, there, there is this sort of dissonance, um, it, it's really interesting. So when I go in, I mean, I, I happen to recognize most, if not all, of the places in the prints. And, you know, that for me is uncanny. I'm like, oh, why do I know these places? And, and in some cases, I've lived through a lot of those moments um, in different ways as well. So there, there's a very strange recognition. and. I think, you know, and, and what we've been 
talking about is also how these images actually then open up a conversational space that is otherwise very difficult for a lot of people. And then this is sort of this extended life of an image or an image mm. object in this case where you know it might not have been what Weiling intended or you know it's not really sort of within that realm of imagination because just because we're not at the same place or the experiences are not utterable. You know, you, you can say certain things, you cannot write down certain things for fear of what might come back to get you later on. But mm. I, I feel that the, the fact that there are these images that offer a distance that actually opens up something very intimate that people can choose to enter. And you will never know what conversation people actually have because of these images. But I think, you know, if you look close enough, if you think about repetition enough, or if mm. you even just see some sort of the images, I, I think it, it has to sort of open conversations that are otherwise not even possible. Mm -hmm. Wailing, I don't know if you want to re respond to that. It's not really a question, but um, how much are you sort of thinking about opening that kind of space? And I know, you know, what, what has it meant for you to bring the project to back to Hong Kong, for example? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that that's, I've had some feedback and I think that, and I was just saying this to Michelle um, earlier today, that I think some of the feedback has been emotional quite emotional and for me it, it's um, perhaps I'm not outwardly such an emotional person so then to have that kind of feedback uh, uh, it's interesting I guess not, in not inter interesting is a bad word to use but it, 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 it makes me think about what is done I think that when you make work it's very difficult to step away from it right or it's very difficult to look at it from like, you know, different, in different ways. So then it has been quite good and surprising for me, I think, to hear that. But then it's also, it's very difficult now because I haven't uh, been in Hong Kong since 2019, you know, 2019. Oh. So then it is, uh, I think it's hard to imagine the, the state of being now, I think, for me at least. Mm. I, I want to um, go back, I guess, to the idea of photography and it's something that we've certainly, you know, for obvious reasons in some ways, talked a lot about in the production of the, the exhibition, um, but the fact that it also figures so strongly in the kind of collaboration that you both devised in the Sightlines project and the way that the camera becomes this common denominator it becomes in in some ways it becomes the space of collaboration itself as a mm. conduit as a medium as i said um and thinking about that i guess in relationship to hong kong and sightlines you know refers to a very specific period of time but in some ways you know hong kong has been thought about as a space of flux and change and so on for a long time um, and so I wonder if that's an opportunity to bring in maybe, Michelle, some of your work mm. with the Ha Archive and thinking about when we were talking, you know, about the, the potential of whether or not to, to, to mention this work or whether or not to refer to it, there were really interesting sort of conversations starting to happen about how somebody like Ha was using photography and sort of picturing the world around him, the art world around him and himself in that world mm. um, in a way which I think might be interesting to, to bring into conversation here. Mm. Um, do you want to bring up some of those slides? Sure, let me do that. Because I'm also, I think that Weiling has some questions about that too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hold on. Of questions as you bring that up. If people do have questions, um, please put them in the QA or chat. We can um, refer to them from there. I mean, 
This is a very sort of, I guess, when, when we think about, you know, how Bakhtin photograph, photographing himself, photographing his work, or, you know, if you read his photography of exhibitions as this sort of, you know, I think Wailing talked about this, like near desperate attempt to be seen and be part of an art scene. I think this is a very interesting very conscious image. attempt. Super <laughs> conscious attempt. Um, I think it's quite interesting to think about, I think one of the things that uh, re re reason that had interested me uh, was that, you know, with sidelines, or, you know, when, do, when we collaborate with other artists, let's say, and trying to think how can we work together uh, to build yeah, the arts, you know, how can we work together to make work? How can we be a part of the scene? Um, so then interestingly for me, when I see these pictures and when I have, when I have seen these pictures of him, you know, uh, the, where he's photographing, going around photographing different exhibitions and, and also then photographing himself in exhibitions and his family, having all of those things, I, I find um, it's, it's quite interesting. So it's just how does the photograph mediate that relationship with the art scene or, or with the peers that uh, we have, I guess, as people who work in the arts, but also then thinking about, I think in the last talk we had with Kama, remember we were talking about one of her mm. photos where they're touching, yeah. they're holding the, mm. the photograph. And it's, it's oh. just this, this, this idea of how the, 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 the photograph creates, or is, is, is almost like a, it immediates this yearning that you have for you know, whatever is in the photograph or whoever is in the photograph. So then it, it's quite interesting for me, like, you know, over the years now to, I guess it's also because I have no impulse to photograph exhibitions, you know, I have no impulse to photograph myself at exhibitions. So, so it's interesting to see somebody who has this impulse, who has done so much of it, uh, so religiously almost. Um, um, and so then it's just how does the, the camera mediate, you know, for him, you know, uh, for us over the years and yeah, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm curious actually um, these look like they've been marked up slides that have been marked up and for cropping yeah and and they're all marked up which is yeah yeah um, what's going on here where do you know where they would have been cropped or used or published so or was this, this was there? so the site where this exhibition took place was the Hong Kong City Hall I think this is probably the high block because the Urban Awards winner exhibition is like a, something organized by the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Uh, and so this is a contact sheet. So this must have been a four by five, right? Um, format contact sheet. Six. Four by six. Six. Yeah. six. Okay. See, not a photo artist. Photo artist. <laughs> um, and so like, uh, and, and the markup, I think, would be either by Ha himself or whoever he hired to photograph. Um, and these were then sort of subsequently reprinted in larger formats. Where, and they, some of them were used later on in his publications. Um, but, you know, like this kind of very consciously posing with his works or, you know, my favorite is definitely the one where he is almost one of his sculptures. Um, and also just, it's just so strange, but it captures the, the, the desire so clearly, right? It's, it's about the work for sure. It's about showing the work and therefore there are these install shots, but it's most important of all about the person behind the making of this work, the artist. Um, you know, not something that everyone would agree with. You know, it's not a, a desire is a very modernist aspiration or desire, which I think is very much in line with um, with Ha as as the artist that he really tried to be, and I guess a little different, or I don't know, maybe it's not, but it's very different from how at least Wailing and I and and Sightlines thought about having a practice, right? Or thought about a career, or thought about being part of a community or part of a conversation. It, it feels like there's yeah, a certain amount that's also taken for granted at this point in time, like without going too much into, um, you know, uh, imagination. But um, 
it seems like there's a sort of safe space here in, in the photographic realm. Um, mm. it's, oh, it's I haven't thought about it that way. Um, you mean a safe space? It, there's a certain confidence in, in what the photograph is doing, um, what it refers to. Um, I, it, like it's, it doesn't seem like a very troubled sort of space um, in, in the sense that I think in you know, your project, I mean, it's totally different, of course, the function and so on, but in your projects, both for sight lines and in the bridge, I mean, that's the space of the frame, the camera and so on is, is what's kind of questioned and there's a, a sort of friction there, um, which is very productive. And here it seems to be you know, very smooth, very flat. Maybe that's just me. It's a very um, calm and sort of stable space. Mm. Uh, but um, I wonder yeah. if that's a, a difference in technology, right? Because now, you know, this was all analog with Ha. So every click is a certain amount of resources that's available and that's being used. Mm. And with our day and age, you know, like photography or cameras, you know, we have a camera in a phone that is way better than a lot of people could have imagined in the 70s. Yeah, uh, better or certainly more ubiquitous. That's something that you've been thinking about a lot, wearing phone cameras. Yes, I use it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, shall we look at more? Uh, I mean, this is the studio shot accumulation. I'm yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm interested also in the sort of reusing of images and this kind of like collaging, literal and metaphorical. Mm. This is his family in an early exhibition in the city hall. Mm. I mean, and then this is sort of when we were at AAA sort of displaying some of the contact sheets. This is how we train sort of re-photographing books, which, you know, like waiting also re-photograph stuff. But I think the purpose was very different. Mm. Um, transformation of, you know, like of exhibition documentation, working with architecture students, then rebuilding the exhibition. And this was the student sort of extra chef's kiss sort of touch because half photographed himself in this exact spot. And so they decided, oh, we should put him back in also. Yeah. It's quite lovely. And yeah, and it's a work by Walid Rad that, you know, actually drew a lot on the portraits that Ha took of himself and his work, right? Yeah. Um, and there are over, there are hundreds of these um, photographic portraits of Ha Chun with his own work over the years. And you actually see him age and, and the work, some of them change, some of them don't. Um, but here, I think it, it's a also interesting manifestation and transformation of, you know, a, a, another artist reading of the desire of cramming, ha, cramming himself into what made the art world and then giving it a physical form and giving it a different experience. It's funny because one of the things you mentioned, you know, thinking back to whaling your current practice is often sort of mining, um, you know, family slides and you know, personal relationships and things like that um, in a way which is not always legible. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm kind of wondering how you're thinking through that. Um, you're not picturing yourself, which is very different. And I'm not trying to draw too much of a parallel between your process and, and Haas. I don't think that's where I want to go with this, but it's more thinking about the personal and I guess your relationship to the medium and how you're thinking about that now, because I know that you've got other projects which are also you know, using microscopic sort of photography to picture the, the surface of the object the surface of the slide, um, but the underlying content, the image is also very personal. Um, how, are you, how are you thinking through where your process is going now um, at, in relation to 
both, I mean, a bridge, but also I know you've got other projects that are doing this. I think that it's in terms of, you know, coming back to Singapore, uh, one of the things um, when I came back, or uh, one of the things that I think about here, and I've been back here for five years, five, 2016, um, is uh, coming back to a place where my family is, which I hadn't been in since, you know, the mid, late 90s. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I started looking more into uh, family archives and um, family photographs, actually. Um, I think when I was in Hong Kong, I think that this idea of displacement, of course, that is still present here, um, but the idea of being, let's say, you're a migrant basically, or I was a migrant, even though I was there for, you know, for a very long time. But it's a place where um, my Cantonese isn't, you know, super duper, and there's always, you're know, always slightly off, even though, you know, many people were great. And I really, I really, you know, Hong Kong was my home also. But at the same time, it, it brought up different ideas, ideas of difference, you know, ideas of the border that, um, that, that don't really, um, manifest here. So then that's, I think that's why coming back here, um, I started looking more and more into these old pictures as opposed to, uh, you know, I guess going out and meeting people and doing that kind of research. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't really, um, it's interesting because I, I think I've spoken to you before about um, your your sort of creative relationship, let's say, with the environment around you in Singapore, and and in some of the work in a bridge, you you've brought these previous, you know, you've shot your apartment through the slides and kind of bridged these distances in some way, um, in a way that I think is 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 really interesting. Trying to muddle or fold these worlds in on one another. Um, it's not a question; it's more of a comment. So um, I mean, I think we've faced an interesting kind of trajectory between Sightlines and your collaboration there and the space of collaboration that's facilitated through the medium. Um, and then thinking about you know, a very different practice with um, Ha's work. Um, but any sort of final questions um, about that process um, from particularly to Michelle and for Wailing's work at this point in time? I mean, you're very familiar with her development of her practice and what she's been working on. I invite you to sort of question where that's where that's going or, or what comes next. Is this for Wailing? On? Yes. Wait, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sort of giving, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm sort of giving you the, the last question in some ways of, you know, you're, you're very familiar with Helene's process and the sort of development of her work. And so I'm wondering where, what your question is regarding her next steps or regarding the sort of trajectory of this project. Also for me to ask Wailing yes. the question. I mean, I don't know if this is controversial or, but I think I'll say it. I miss the mess. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's really been wonderful. I mean, I love seeing how, how, how the formal turn has taken, but I also wonder, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, compressing all of that mess or that sort of excess, not excess, but this sort of this turbulence, right? Or this sort of experience where you just, you see people's displacement, and you have a you have feelings or you have thinking thoughts about that, and to see that being compressed onto a two D surface, and it's a fascinating process to see. But I kind of I'm just waiting to see what happens when this compression sort of gets pushed even more, and I think it's something else going to come out, and I, I I'm I'm interested to see how the not the anger but 
how the mess or that sort of mass, that stickiness that for me has always been that complexity of where you say it's not complex. No, I'm not saying it's not complex. I think it's very complex, but it's getting pushed to a very flat surface. And I think there's only so much you can play with a flat surface. You're not going to be satisfied with a flat surface very soon. No, I, I think that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, the containment. You know, I, I don't think that's your thing. So I'm just reaching, hmm, twiddling my thumbs, <laughs> seeing what's coming out of that. But I, I think it's actually, it's really, really hard to make a photo of a, a photo a photograph like a that can contain all of this and i think it's actually a really good challenge i think for um quite a few years i was uh, working with projections or other things i still do work with projections but maybe as, as, as something also um, in parallel with the photograph but for me that was all kind of was a very natural step leading back to the print and for many years I didn't make uh, prints because I was actually quite sick of the space mm. up actually and I, I didn't want to make any objects for mm. quite a while mm. so but then I think that it is actually really difficult to make a photograph so I think that is quite a good challenge I think that you you say that it's all very contained but I, I think within that photograph there are things that I see and like oh no you know so it, sometimes it does still feel like, oh, how do I put it together? You know, there's something that shouldn't be there. Then. And so then there is still that kind of thing, but I guess it's all within that piece of paper. It's interesting because there's a flatness, but on the other hand, I, I feel like there's a density to the current work, which is very different. Um, I've been reading a little bit recently in a work from a very different context, but the idea is interesting. Um, uh, this is Jennifer Deger, a writer on, on sort of indigenous photography and Photoshop mm. and things like this. And she talks about thick photography. Mm. What she describes as thick photography is actually mm. thinking about um, the relationships that are involved in what's come together to make this image. So, I mean, some people talk about, um, you know, the image event, um, mm. that, that, you know, that, that images are not a moment, they're actually, you know, continuously unfolding because of the shifting meaning around them, things like this. Um, but I, I quite like this idea of thick photography that's talking to relationships, you know, as well. So it's, so it's kind of questioning not only the, the medium, like, like the form that this image takes, but also all of the, the before and after, yeah. um, like what's come before that point, the before this form that it takes and what comes afterwards. And you've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about the afterlife of some of these images as well. And I, I wonder about that, you know, the, that it's difficult in some ways to pin down exactly where those images start and finish. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think that that's, you can see that a little bit in the process where now, with through the microscopic sort of photography mm. there is a a suggestion of infinite space <laughs> i mean it sounds kind of cheesy but you know in a way that i think is quite potent you know because our world is often contained or constrained by different things so to suggest a, a something always beyond is is interesting um but this is very much my reading as well. I, I also like that. I'm reminded of Toni Morrison uh, mm -hmm. in Beloved. You know, that, you know, I think it was Seth talking to, I forgot the other character, but you know, love is or it ain't, thin love ain't love at all. It's also then about thickness, right? That viscosity mm. that actually is, is very demanding, even though what, what comes out on the, you know, in, in this case, this photograph, a, a surface seems to be easy to consume. And in some, in some cases, it's almost a seductive object, right? Because it's shiny. Mm. It asks you to sort of go closer and then you like recognize parts mm. of it. But yeah, I guess maybe it is, you know, I think the thick, thickness. I've always seen Whaling's practice as something that's very 
complex and very sick. I think sickness is a, oh, is a cool. very good way to describe it. And she smiles. Um, I, I have opened the floor to questions. Um, we still have a, a moment for one question or we can sort of leave it with thickness and that, that will sort of leave, leave us with the surface um, of the image. Um, yeah, okay, I might. Sounds good. I Thank might you. focus there. So um, thanks again, Michelle Waring. Um, it's been a, a pleasure being able to talk to you. I wanted to also, and I forgot to say a thanks to WMA. I know I guess it's kind of had to leave, but um, I wanted to thank them for you know, facilitating these conversations and supporting um, the development of these conversations um, as part of the project, because they've been such a conscious part of bringing out some of the ideas that we've been talking about. Um, so uh, you mentioned, Michelle, that these conversations you know, continue. Uh, if this you know, conversation never ends, um, it certainly feels like that um, here. But for today, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Thank both you. of you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.